on People Behind the Puppets. I'm speaking to Peter O'Rourke. Now, Peter is a designer, maker and director and has worked on loads of shows here at Little Angel. Hello, Peter. Hello. I'm Angel. Hello, Angel. Hello. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Now, Peter, can you tell us how you got into puppet making? Um, well, it was a long time ago in the... Um, late 70s, early 80s, I was doing a fine art course in, at Newcastle Polytechnic, as it was at the time. And I, um, after spending two years mostly painting, uh, sometimes doing kind of sequences of paintings, so there was sort of, I wanted to add an element of time into it, I started thinking about making um, puppets and that, that would be an interesting approach. I started looking at the aesthetics of puppets, which I've always liked, and then I found that there was so much kind of potential. I mean, I was like, I remember there was a book called, um, it's a book about performance art, I can't remember the exact title, by a woman called Rosalie Goldberg, and in that I had pictures of puppets by Oscar Schlemmer, or rather costumes that sort of were kind of very big constructed costumes uh, by Oscar Schlemmer, who worked at the bar house, uh, a, a woman called Sophie Tauber Arp, who, who made these really strange uh, marionettes. Um, and I started reading Jerry's Ubu plays, things like that. And just like, I just was aware that there was a lot of potential. So in the last year at college, at, and on my three year degree, I I made it with a, with a friend, we had a, a giant uh, puppet show, uh, oh. which went down like a lead balloon. Oh and, no! Because uh, it was on a fine art course and, oh. and most of the fine artists thought, well, we don't do flower arranging on this course. Why should we do puppetry? But anyway, it, having finished that course, I got the bug, and then I just started trying to find work. Uh, I moved to Norwich, where, the, where Norwich Puppet Theatre had just been open for about maybe, I think, five, six years, something like that at the mm -hmm. time. Um, volunteered, and then started getting work as a marionettist, as a, a performer on, on various um, shows. Um, mostly touring, so do a lot of touring. And then um, I sort of came to the conclusion that though I enjoyed operating puppets and was, was fairly adept at it, I really, really wasn't a performer. I didn't thrive on performance. Mm. And so I moved over to thinking about making, which I neglected completely. And I got a job at Spitting Image and I worked at Spitting Image for a while oh, making... that's a TV show. Yeah, yes. it's a sort of like mm -hmm. a political TV show mm. um, using puppets that... Um, mm. It's, it's come back again recently, actually, mm -hmm. but um, uh, doing a lot of mechanics and all that kind of thing. Worked on various other productions from as a kind of offshoot of working there. And then um, I just remember one day coming to Little Angel, um, Lindy asked me to come and see if I wanted to make a, a, a set, you know, just a little bit of a set. Mm -hmm. And um, I just remember walking in here and thinking, this is great, you could, you could thrive here, mm -hmm. you know, and I think... I, I would sort of credit the little angel as giving me the chances to develop as an artist, which was something that I'd kind oh. of um, not been doing for, you know, I'd just, that had just been on hold, really. But um, so, yeah, yeah. And then the rest just developed from there, I think. Oh, gosh. That was your question. Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. You've done so much. Um, you've got a puppet here with you today. Yeah. This one. Can we have a look? Sure. Well, um, one of the things, just before I pick up the puppet, is mm -hmm. I just wanted to say is that um, when you make puppets, it's not it, it, it's usually not in a kind of vacuum. It's, it's usually for something, uh, and therefore you need to sort of like um, know a lot about the context in which it's going to be used. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, so sometimes you'll build a puppet for one person to operate uh, that, that that has to be fully operable by one person, and another occasion you might make a puppet that has you know, three people operating it, and your approach to each one would be very, very different. Mm. And that would also depend on the, um, you know, the context of how many performers there are on a show and what the show is about, etc. Yes. So, so this, which isn't for a show, funny enough, but this, I, I just wanted to make this puppet, which, um, uh, funny enough, my my wife, this was years ago, I made this puppet, and it was. My wife had, was, I think, trying to encourage me to start making full puppets rather than just bits of things which I've been doing for a long time. And um, so I made this with the idea of, like, could I make a, a, um, a rider on a horse where 
both the horse and the rider are operated by the same puppeteer. Oh. For some reason, I made it a skeleton. Oops, just knocked the mic. Um, <laughs> and as you can see, you can get kind oh. of like a, a sort of a sense of, I guess, with with kind of uh, a lot of choreography, you can you can get the the, the two the, the skeleton man and the skeleton horse to have their own minds. If you see what I mean, yes, they it's both sort of look like, alive. And but also. It's an exercise in, in the limits. So it can do one, one set of movements very well, but you, couldn't, you can't make it pat the, the man pat the horse's head, say, for example. Do you know what mm, I mean? I because see, everything's yes. fixed. And it's just an illustration of how pivot points work in a puppet. Oh. If you get the pivot points right, the puppet comes alive and is puppeteer friendly. And so, that's a big thing. Well, that's really interesting. It yeah. can do some things really well, yeah. but others not so much. So when you're making a puppet, yeah. what are three things you need to consider? Well, I, I think that you need to, first of all, um, say if you were making a puppet for a, a, a project that, say, somebody else was directing mm -hmm. and uh, somebody else was designing the set or whatever, then what you'd want to know is as much as possible about the context in which that puppet's going to be used. Mm -hmm. So you want to know um, how the puppeteers stand in the space, where, uh, how the puppet is going to be in relation to where they're standing, um, also how many how many puppeteers are likely to be on that puppet. Um, so there's no point in making a puppet with lots of separate moving elements that need more than one in person to operate them if, in the end, only one person's going to be operating the puppet. Mm -hmm. So you need to know as much as possible about that. You need to know um, something about what is expected aesthetically, because um, that can, as I mentioned earlier, the range of aesthetic approaches to a puppet can be can be huge. You, know, the, you mean what it looks like? What it looks like, yeah. Um, the kind of style of it. Mm. Um, all these kind of things sort of are, are, are what... Uh, Bring, bring the bring the puppet in line with the production, but also give it a sense of playfulness. Mm. So, you know, sometimes very kind of detailed carved heads and things just won't suit the the kind of the mood of the show, and you want something more kind of playful. Uh, so there's there's that you need to take into account. You also need to take into account the deadline, uh, how long you've got to make, yes. and, to, and to make very your, important. Yeah, and make your um, expectations and the expect and um, encourage the expectations and the people receiving the puppet to be kind of like tailored to the time available and the resources available to a certain extent. So those mm -hmm. things might influence the technique you use. You know, yes. instead of carving, you might um, kind of construct the puppets in, in a different way. So do, carving takes a long time then. It can take a long time, um, especially if you want to be fairly detailed. Um, but then, as I say, it mightn't be right. You might want for the production. You might want, want to do something much more simple and hmm. broad. You know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned style. How would you describe your style? Okay. Um, I think uh, it's a difficult one because I think my style of approach or my method of approach maybe might be a good way to to say that is that i i like to look at the um the project as a whole uh and then sort of in a way kind of analyze the needs of it so what, what what's a really nice thing is to start out with a with a project and it's a little bit of a blank sheet to begin with and then you know a little bit about the project and so my style of approach would often be just to start looking around me at things in the world uh kind of textures, shapes and things and see how they're kind of like a, might be appropriate towards the project in hand. Mm. Uh, I would look at various artists um, and art movements and see how there might be clues in, in the, the kind of work done in the fine arts to, to, to sort of like help find the style um, of, the, of the individual production. And that's a really exciting part of it is that sort of finding the finding the kind of style and then the, the kind of the, the actual style of the construction etc that all that kind of side kind of falls into place once you've sort of read around the subject and once you've sort of uh, realized analyzed what is needed and you um and you and and 
also about the, as I say, the, the time available. So you sort of like analyze all those things mm -hmm. and try and throw in a playful element. I suppose the style is probably quite playful in lots of ways. Um, and then what I'd like to do is for each production to have a, its own kind of distinct style. Mm -hmm. But within it, I realize there will be techniques that I use, you know, and I use things like, um, uh, photocopies for for kind of covering the set, um, you know, either black and white coloured or tinted. Um, I use very simple shapes because I also know that if you're building a set, if it's full of curves and sort of um, various kind of like difficult to construct um, kind of elements, that's going to be very, very time consuming and therefore quite expensive. So your style gets kind of formed by um, by the circumstances, really. Mm, yes, but there's I think lots of just things general, that you have to take on board. Yeah, there's lots of things mm. you have to take on board. And I, and I think in general, I, I, it's difficult to pinpoint a style, but I think that usually I'm trying to find a kind of playfulness mm. in there, a visual playfulness. And, and, and when I'm sort of choreographing, uh, choreographing pieces, I like to try and find kind of playful, slightly off the wall kind of ways of oh. choreographing <laughs> I like as well. that, off the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Peter, I've just spotted you've brought a very different type of puppet with you as well. Yeah, okay, I'll show you that one. Yes, it's, please. Um, so this is um, from a production called The Dong with a Luminous Nose, mm. um, which is based on an Edward Lear uh, poem. And um, okay, so where's that? Where's with the. Um, where's with the skeleton on horseback? We could have. Um, you know, one person is operating two characters, really. Yes, and, and yes. it's all in the build and in the, the kind of pivot points. Mm -hmm. This puppet really, I can't really make this puppet come to life because it needs three people to do so. Oh, it's three got so, people on one puppet? Yeah, three people on oh. one puppet. And it has um, all different parts which are very directly controlled, just with simple handles on the on the back of the head and on, on the back there, you can mm -hmm. see. And so there's, there's various, there's lots of pivot points in this in this. Um, in this puppet. If I'll show you the hands, for example, there's a kind of like a little string here which flexes the hand backwards and forwards like that. Mm. And also a bar going through the arm which turns it. And so again with the the legs, there's there's you know pivot point on the ankles, on the knees, different kind of pivot point on the um the 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 hip. Mm. And so so really um, you would only build this kind of puppet when, we, you know, what I was saying before about being confident that there's going to be three people on the puppet all the time so that you can get full kind of animation. There's also something really satisfying about watching three puppeteers or working with three puppeteers to make it feel um, believable and and, 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 as, and playfully animated, really. You know, so there's a very different kind of quality here um, to the to the skeleton puppets. It's a skeleton puppet. Um, the other thing is that one thing I really like to do in shows is to to sort of mix and match. So you've got something like this that takes three puppeteers mm. to operate. So uh, the, the next thing that comes on and interacts with that character might just be one one operated by one puppet. And in, in shows I've done that by making um, those two characters be glove puppets so again one person can operate two so it's like mixing and matching and I think mixing and matching the different styles of um, operation mm. adds to the kind of playfulness and the fun of watching a puppet show yes of course yeah. so really thinking about how many puppeteers you want at each moment and then like you say like a, a mix and match yeah. and a puppet like this must take quite a long time to make yeah, it, it did take quite a long time to melt, but but it's one of ten, I think maybe eleven versions of this character in the in the production, and so to be honest, I was making all of them at once to a certain extent. So wow. so you're making lots of units and things. So it's very difficult to narrow down and say how long this would take to make yes. um, in itself, but probably uh, two and a half weeks, something like that, to make. Wow. You know. Um, yes. I have to, I'm just very conscious it's also very, very scuffed. That's because it's been through a, a um, whole season here at the Little Angel Theatre mm. and it'll need all painting up and made nice again before going yes. out on the road Back again. to the workshop for a paint yeah. job. Yeah, so it's, yes. they're going out on the road on, in the autumn, so mm. we need to get them all nicely 
freshened up for them. I see, I see. Well, I think, do you have a maybe a simpler puppet that we could make at home? Yes, I've, I've, I've brought some si very simple puppets in. Um, now, I made these on my kitchen table because I know one of the things was like, have to be something that you don't rely on having them having a workshop to, mm. to sort of make. So so I've made a couple of chicken, they're cereal box chickens, really. Oh! <laughs> you know, so they're made out of simple cereal boxes. And there's just a simple um, handle on the tail, another handle on the head. And then the handle on the head has some strings, mm. which make the wings flap. Gosh, and the head moves, the neck, the wings. Yeah, all by just these two handles. <laughs> okay, so and also the thing is that they're made out of um, cereal boxes. Mm -hmm. So um, we've provided, you know, patterns and things for people to follow. To, oh yes, to on the these. website. Yes, you can download them. Yeah, that's right. It's all all the instructions are there with photographs of each stage of how to make them. But the other thing is the patterns are the same on this chicken and this one here. But I've made them out of different cereal boxes, ah. so so you get a very different sort of look. To a certain extent. Yeah, different so, colours, different styles. So whatever um, uh, cereal boxes you choose, you're going to get your own kind of look to it, really. Yes. And a part of the playfulness of making these is just to sort of like decide what colour do you want it. And, you know, uh, a chicken made out of Cheerio boxes is going to be very <laughs> different from one made out of um, Special K. Yeah, you know? of So course. it's going to be very different. And then, yeah. and then keep the faces simple so the eyes show on them Brilliant. so i hope people enjoy trying to make them that um, well hopefully the, the instructions are clear um, yes yes i'm sure they will yeah. enjoy it peter thank you very much for joining us it has been a pleasure talking to you thank you thank you, pleasure. Thank you. bye everyone see you next time Bye.